In 1996, a musical opened on Broadway that took the theatrical world by storm. That musical was Rent, and it was the creation of composer Jonathan Larson. It went on to win four Tony Awards, including Best Musical, and by the time it ended its 12-year Broadway run, it had been performed on five continents. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing Board, and today we're joined by several recipients of the 2009 Jonathan Larson grants. Established by Jonathan's family after his untimely death, the Jonathan Larson grants have been given to emerging composers, lyricists, and book writers. Originally administered by the Jonathan Larson Performing Arts Foundation, the grants became a part of the wing earlier this year. I would like you all to join me in applauding all of the recipients of the 2009 Jonathan Larson Grants. They are Mark Allen, Dave Malloy, Thomas Miser, Curtis Moore, and Ryan Scott Oliver. Where we go, the women are wet, splashing under a sea. It's all water sweat, they splash around their sleeves. The boys are happy and hot in their home underground and darling. Joining me to talk about the challenges facing up-and-coming composers and lyricists in the theater today are composer Mark Allen, composer and lyricist Dave Malloy, and the songwriting team of Thomas Miser and Curtis Moore. Welcome. And may I start by congratulating you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming on this program. Um, I thought we should start, and I'd love to ask Mark, if you could just explain to us a little bit about the Jonathan Larson Grants. It, it more affects me because of its, because of Jonathan's career and the way people see musical theater after his writing, um, and being a part of that heritage as being uh, and being a part of this grant um, is a really important thing for us as newer writers. I won't say that we're also new, <laughs> but <laughs> newer writers, in that you know it gives us a chance to you know share some of the work that he's done, and you know it, you know. It, it gives us a chance to in, enjoy some of where musical theater was going post you know, his seminal work. So. And I think it's a two-pronged thing because it's not just the monetary grant, which is great, because we all know that writing for music theater is not necessarily a cash cow industry <laughs> at this stage of your career, but also it's the chance to not only meet these other people, but be put out there and have your name heard and to not be playing in your room together by yourself which is what we do a lot of, it's great to be out there and have people go, oh, wait, this is a team to notice, or these are writers to notice, which is a huge step. Right, and also continue that, but personally, the same thing. I mean, it's also great to have sort of some justification and some sort of encouragement, because like, like Tom said, you know, you spend years, we can spend years working on something, and you know, maybe you play it for your friends in your garage, or you do some demos, or you, you, know, you, you, you get a small production somewhere if, if you're really lucky, but it's so hard to sort of get, um, any kind of uh, substantial feedback. So these kind of uh, grants and awards and, and recognition, it just is an, a great encouragement in, um, in what is often a really long and involved process with what yeah, we do. Yeah, it says to keep going, really, in, in one of the strongest ways possible. Because there, obviously the, world, the words musical theater uh, are, encompass a very wide spectrum, um, what attracted you to that world and what in that spectrum made you you know, interested in it to begin with, Mark, with, with band geeks on the, well, on the know, horizon. Yeah, uh, and that's all like, very exciting stuff. I, I think I'm gonna, I assume that I may have a completely different story than a lot of you guys. Um, I started off wanting to pursue a career in acting. Um, uh, my wife and I came to graduate school auditions and things like that uh, to just, you know, kind of see if we could, you know, start that road. I found out about the NYU program for graduate musical theater writing, and my wife said, you should submit to that, because I've been a songwriter in Nashville you know, for a long time and a uh, studio person. And I said, sure, why not? Got into the program for whatever reason. They liked me. <laughs> um, and since then, it's just kind of one of those things that generates all the passion, which you guys may have had a much, a lot, you know, much longer time than I. 
because uh, it's passionate music. It's, it's forward music. It's, it's doing something rather than just saying one thing over and over. It's, it's moving story and, and dramatic music. I guess I've always been attracted to more in film scores up till, you know, I started writing for musical theater. But that's, you know, that's what still pulls me forward in it. And, you know, things like band geeks, having been a marching band geek myself, you know, it's those stories of personal struggle and, and journey and, and passion that, you know, really drive me. So, Tell us a little bit about Band Geek since, you, <laughs> since we're here. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel, I feel bad talking about without my other collaborators here, but uh, last year, one of last year's Jonathan Larson winners, or recipients, right. um, Gabby Alter uh, is uh, one of the collaborators, and uh, our third collaborator, uh, Tommy Newman, is writing the book uh, with uh, Gordon Greenberg. And uh, we started this process a couple of years ago uh, Tommy and I were both band geeks, and we thought. And Tommy said, "Hey, well, why don't we write a show about it?" And I thought, "All right, worth a shot, you know." Um, and as it came out, and then we, uh, and then when uh, Gabby, you know, he kind of put some of the first fruits down as far as music, and kind of developed a sound that is not just marching band music, but it's rock-inspired marching band music or marching band-inspired rock music. So it's <laughs> it's this really neat marriage of, you know, telling the down and out kind of success story. Of, of a high school marching band. That's great. Um, and I know the Goodspeed uh, is, has, has eyes on it. Goodspeed Musicals has been, you know, our cherished friend in this whole process, you know, even in the other works that we've uh, written together and apart. So it's, yeah. We, we're, did, did, it, did anybody else do the NYU program or any other of the, of the programs for writing musical theater? Well, we actually came to New York to do the NYU writing program. And uh, unfortunately, we both dropped out. Um, <laughs> That's up here. Some very, very good people <laughs> dropped out. Of very, very good we, programs. We dropped out um, right before it started for a lot of reasons, personal and financial and, and whatnot. And we were both, you were two years out of school, and I was coming right out of undergraduate. Thanks for aging me. <laughs> well, that was last year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so we, so, but we did BMI, which, uh, the BMI Music Theater Program, right. which, which I loved and had a great time in and learned quite a bit from. And that's, that's not an academic program. That, no. That's BMI, the, uh, the what, what do you call ASCAP and BMI there? The, uh, rights, uh, rights, rights organization. Rights organization. Right. Um, the, the BMI workshop is the famous one that was started by Lehman Engel years mm -hmm. ago. And if, if I'm correct, you all play for each other. You get, you get assignments and play for each other and then get critiqued by authors? By your peers. By your peers. Yes. And which is actually the best part about it, was that we met a group of people. It's really a way to foster relationships with other writers. And we have a group of friends from that program that we still go to today and talk to and sort and of write work, with. And write with. And uh, that was, to us, the best thing about the program, was getting to know a group of writers in New York when you felt like, does anyone else do this? How does this work? And there was a room full of people who were asking who the, same the same question. question. Exactly. <laughs> and luckily, a lot of them have gone on now to be very successful. And so it's been a great, you know, our Encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> now, Dave, you, you, you work with a collaborative theater company? Yeah, I, I work with this group, Banana Bag and Bodice, and that's, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't intend to go into musical theater at all. <laughs> I'm totally surprised that I'm here. Um, that's all right. Nice no, to I mean, have I mean, you. I mean, in general, like, in this, this place in my career. Um, like, I went to school for just, just straight-up composition, and so I was writing, like, you know, avant-garde classical music for chamber ensembles and things like that, and didn't touch theater at all. Um, although, like, I definitely I had this, like, dramatic thing going in my music, for sure, but I never really connected it with theater. And then I moved to San Francisco, like, 10 years ago and just, um, just stumbled into a theater piece. I was working at a record store. This guy needed a keyboard player for a theater piece. And I was like, okay, sure. And, uh, and I was like, wow, this is really neat. Like, I really enjoyed it. Um, and so then, yeah, I really got started doing like just like ensemble-based like experimental theater. And like my first, so the, the group I'm with now, Banana Bag and Bodice, the first show I did with them wasn't a musical at all. It was this prison piece, and I was like in the corner playing uh, harmonicas and fishbowls through delay pedals. Like that was, <laughs> that was the score. Awesome. Um, and so just over the years with that group, um, more and more music got involved in our shows. And now the the, the new show that we're doing is a, is a full-scale musical based on Beowulf. So.
So where in that, um, did you listen to any albums of musicals? Uh, you know? I mean, you know, as a kid, like, you know, when, when uh, I remember a really strong memory of being a kid is when the PBS would have their fun drive. They would always play the Music Man. Right. And that was so special to me. <laughs> that, was a, that was a really These fun are time. important. These yeah, are important. Yeah. And, and, and the Miss Saigon, of course, I got really into it. Yes, well. you, you, I do have to ask you, there's, you refer to it the 99 cent Miss Saigon. And yeah. Right, well, and I, that I, was really the piece that, that really pushed me into the musical theater world. Um, this, this amazing director uh, based in Oakland now, Maya Garantz. Um, she had been doing all this like really cool community-based theater in like Miss rural Mississippi and all this kind of stuff, and just doing all this really poor shoestring theater. And um, so when she moved to to Oakland, she decided that she wanted to do the biggest musical of all time on the smallest budget possible. So we did Miss Saigon, but the 99 cent Miss Saigon. So doing it as cheaply as possible. So we had like a GI Joe helicopter <laughs> that flew down on a zip line, and uh, all the actors were playing music, were playing instruments as well. We had you know, hands for guns. The kid, we used a, a, a ball of yarn with a balloon that represented the kid, because we couldn't hire, hire a kid actor. Of course, right. we and where, did, where was this done? Uh, it was done in a middle school in Berkeley, California, Willard, the Willard Metal Shop Theater. It was actually an old abandoned metal shop. They would removed all the metal stuff from it, and it was just like this big, vast, cavernous like cafeteria-like room. And so we just set up a bunch of chairs. I mean, we had no set to speak of, really. It was a bunch of ladders. That was basically what it was. So if you had been the composer of Miss Saigon mm -hmm. and walked into this room and saw the 99 cent Miss Saigon, what would you have felt? Well, I, I think I would have felt really good about it, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, one thing that we really tried to do in that show was to really balance, like, reverence with satire. Because I, mean, I think in a lot of ways, it really is a beautiful show. And I, think, I mean, I love the music from it. I think it's really beautiful. And there's a really, really heartbreaking story in it. I mean, but there's also a lot of, like, you know, weird not quite uh, well thought out gender stuff and, and politics stuff and, and some weird stuff. Um, so we tried to balance those two things. And so we tried to make the music, but we tried to make the music really as, as sincere as possible. And so we stripped down the arrangements. It was just like piano, guitar, clarinet, and violin. Our, our Ellen played clarinet, so that was helpful. And oh, so I was great. playing Chris and <laughs> playing piano. Um, well, certainly we read a lot about how Broadway wants to reduce the size of orchestras. Um, what's your feeling, when, when you write a show, do you, do you conceive it for whatever, no costs involved, and then have a moment when you have to shrink it all down to the reality? Well, well I think that there, I mean, that's a, I have, a, so I could talk for hours on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I've done, I mean, you know. You're also an arranger in yeah, an orchestra. Yeah, I work, I work as a arranger in an orchestra sometimes, and I, you know, I'm a member of the music union and all these, you know, but I think that um, you know, there's two schools of thought, and, I, and I, we struggle between both of these. If you're writing for the theater, sometimes you, you know, the reality is you have to sort of work within the parameters that you're going to be working in. You know, you can, you know, and one, set, one side says, you know, you shouldn't really be thinking of doing a show that's going to require a 75-piece orchestra and a children's choir. And you can think orchestra. about it, but you may never see it. You may it, never right? see it. But at the same time, another part of, a part of you says that you should not worry about those things. You should just write what you need to write, whatever it requires. And if it's good, and if it speaks to someone, then it will happen in some way. But I mean, I think there's, I think, I think we live somewhere between those two spaces. You know what I mean? I think if, if we were only listening to um, you know, a producer side of things, and this is not entirely true, but jokingly I say, we'd probably write a show with one actor and a kazoo, you know what I mean, playing the audience. I mean, that's, you know, with, with a block that you right. can move around on the stage, bare feet. Um, but you know, the truth- That's a challenge that you might but take it is up a challenge. Exactly, maybe. maybe that could actually, that, be, that the could actually be a really thing. great, exciting thing too. No, but I think, you know, we, we write I think we, we generally write what we want to write, and we try to envision what that's going to be in our heads with as much or as little as we need. And then we'll see from there, we, you know, when we, when we do things, what works and what doesn't work. Certainly well. we learned a lesson. The first, you know, our first show out of school when we were, met was a, an adaptation of The House of Seven Gables that, you know, we knew nothing, and it had a 30-person cast with a huge set envisioned, and that's not going to be done anytime soon, <laughs> and, and shouldn't be. But uh, <laughs> it could uh, be done in high schools. But well, what would be done yeah, exactly. on Broadway? Yeah, exactly. But we learned from that that you know there's there's also a value to realizing some limitations and saying okay how how can we even be more creative though by thinking how yeah. to that's how yeah. double like, people like you said, you and know, it leads to that kind of working stuff. working on a 99 cent version of Miss Saigon it's going to make you do things with that show that it never would have you know the production on Broadway was beautiful mm -hmm. that was a gorgeous enormous production but I can only imagine 
you know, I'm, I'm even sitting here thinking, knowing that show, like, how are they have done this scene? I want to talk to you about right. it because you should, I'm sure. <laughs> no, but I'm sure that it then required you guys to be really creative. It about did, that. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it really, yeah. It made so much of it like we never would have done it like that if we had had the huge orchestra. Like right. we, we did Sun and Moon, like with with me playing accordion and and our Kim played ukulele. So it, and it turned into this beautiful, yeah, but that's beautiful. That's, it's, it's it was, fantastic. It was really nice. Yeah. yeah. It is. I mean, as somebody who by day runs a house of authors, and you are all authors, there's an interesting question about how much how much leeway you as authors will give further interpreters, but at the same time, how much leeway you as creators should be given by others if you are interpreting something like that. Again, I, that's, I think that's an interesting uh, you know, I, a concept, because I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a revisionist. Um, and I, I sort of, I'm a little bit on your lines, where I sort of think, if someone respects the work and really has a passion for what it stands for, or has a vision for what it actually means in some way or another, and I think and I mean, even if it's not even entirely the original author's vision, but a vision that respects the writing of it, then I, I think that people should be free to do interpretation as they see fit. You know, I mean, I don't think that, there, you know, there's, it's a blurry line. There's no straight line here. There, you know, there's a, it's a slippery slope. I think that you don't want to go so far away from the art that you can't do that. But I think that there should be a, um, a system set in place to sort of facilitate those kind of things. Because you can't do Miss Saigon right. anywhere else like it's been done originally. You can't. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way that unless you had that money again. And, and even now on Broadway, I don't think that you'd be able to do that production again right. in today's market, in today's economic situation. And how many members of the band and band geeks? <laughs> well, uh, we, we've talked about this for a long time. And you know, and just to kind of add on to what they were saying, you know, the, specifically about band geeks, we're looking for a specific sound. I mean, you can't talk about a marching band and not see a marching band. But we also know that up to a point to where an orchestrator gets involved or you know, so we can actually get some band members, everything has to be on a piano. But you also want to sell the same show that you originally, you, you were eventually going to want to see, which is the toughest thing in the entire world yes, yeah. to try to get that across. Hey, this is a marching band really playing, ha <laughs> ha. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's tough. But for, you know, for this particular show, you know, we talked about having the people on stage being a representative of a much larger group but I think right now, we've got it pared down to where it's just this really ragtag group of about 12 people in a high school marching band. And we've seen marching bands, you know, of very small number. Like, it was funny, we, the, M, uh, the MIT marching band is like eight people. Like the football team, you know, sure. it, right. you know, exactly. But it's, you know, it, what, it doesn't change the story for us, for it to be a representative group of a large number of people or just this group of people. And just think you're doing the John Doyle production, and when John Doyle gets to do it, he'll put the, he'll t make an orchestra. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Take the actors he'll and take, let them act, and let exactly. the orchestra play the music. You know, we've talked about that. You know, I would love to see the actors seems playing. Seems like it's the perfect show for that. Well, it's, yeah. yeah, it seems like you know this is this is John Doyle's bag. You know, <laughs> um, you know, but you know we we you know we also understand the limitations of you know finding enough people who can play as well as we hope a marching band would be. So you know we're I, I personally. When I write, I, I end up doing demos you know, for a lot of the songs. And when I do a demo, I hear it all at once. And that may be to my discredit or credit, but you know, then the task is always wrangling it back in because I know it's going to really live on a piano for you know, a number of months, perhaps years. And so this particular, you know, we've made some submissions with Band Geeks, and so we've tried to do full demos of how we want it to sound. And whether or not that scares people off or excites people, it's still kind of. It is a catch you know. twenty-two. I, yeah. I do the exact same thing you do, and we both do do this. You know, where you, you know, we'll sit in the room and we'll write using whatever we decide to write with, whether it's piano or we're writing with just our, just kind of in the clear or, or whatever. But when we do a demo, it's it's usually fairly realized, you know. And what we found is that people, I mean, people that listen to your demos generally, I think people are there's so much a plethora of information this, these days that. A lot of times, people listening don't have the imagination to see beyond a piano arrangement. Do you know what I mean of, of a song these days? You know, even I mean, I remember I remember reading all these books about even in the in sort of the pop music world, you'd go into Clive Davis's office and you'd sit at the piano and you'd play a song, and then he'd be like, "This is fantastic! I'm going to put it on Barry Manilow's album." You know, and you right. you know, but you can't do that. You have to submit a song now that sounds exactly like it's going to sound when Kelly Clarkson sings it. It can't be. You know, you can't put since you've been gone on a piano arrangement, expect anyone to have any idea what that song is going to sound like. And I think the same is true a little bit when we apply for things in theater. You need to sort of 
even if it even if it is unrealistic. Like we do demos where I'm using instrumentation that I would never get, you know, a, f a full orchestra sound or, but at least it gives, it, it lets you express it as you hear it in your head. Mm -hmm. Whether or not, you know, there's of course those parameters that you'd eventually have to pull back from, but I think it's a good way to get your idea out on paper. And, and I think sometimes it does scare people away, but other times it, it, it shows you exact, shows the other person exactly what you're thinking about with yourself. Well, and this place in our careers, you know, Janine Tesori sits down on the piano, and you know what she can do, because you've heard it. Right. She sits down on the piano, and you hear it. We sit down on the piano, and you may or may not have any idea who we are, you know, how, we, how big it can be. But you know, so sending it out, you know, how you'd love to see it done, you know, ends up being the, the way we tend to go. So we could build us a house right out on the water, two stories high. Well, Mark, I know that when you heard that we were going to be sitting around a piano here, you saw to it that you had a cast on your Absolutely. arm. Absolutely. <laughs> <But I wanna laughs> Absolutely. I want to see if we can put Curtis on the spot, since we oh, are sitting gosh. around the Steinway. Just because, I mean, you've been talking about a piano, and if there's anything, right. anything from your work that you could give us an example of, of, you know, of how, how something um, is well expressed in, in the piano, and maybe then explain how, how you would see it being bigger? Oh, gosh, that puts me on the spot. Um, well, okay, you know what? I, I'll play a little bit of this. Um, I'll, I'll spin this. Okay. Um, to be about that. I'm going to play that. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Spin, musical theater has some spin in it. Right, that's exactly. all right. That's all right. So, I mean, speaking. Well, no, I think I'll just speak to I think what's, what's interesting is that we're, one of our shows right now is actually a bluegrass based show. And in almost every situation we get into where we're going to present a song, they've got a piano. Well, that just doesn't work for any of this material. We have to have a guitar, we have to have a banjo. And that's the dilemma of how to sort of show that stuff off. Now certainly on a demo, we bring in great musicians and we do it, but you know, here we are at a piano. How do we, how do well, we so, express that? And it'll be interesting because this song is, I mean, I have a, we have a piano score because we have to do this when we rehearse on piano, but it's, it is envisioned for um, a bluegrass band. So there's no piano ever in the show. If they're, if they're, you know, if this, if this show is done, when it's done, <laughs> there will be no piano. So this is a, um, one of those moments where I think Tom and I, we, we had came up with the idea um, of, of doing the show. Can you give, give us a two second quick synopsis of what the show is Great. about? Thanks, Curtis. Um, <laughs> That's right, you are collaborating. Right. This is okay. Uh, it's uh, called The Legend of Stagecoach Mary, and it's based on the true story of a woman named Mary Fields, who was an ex slave who went off to Montana to meet her best friend, who turned out to be the uh, um, mother superior of a convent, and Mary became a Wild West heroine. You probably never heard of her, but she was a cigar smoking. Um, pistol packing, amazing woman. And it's really about this mother superior and uh, white woman and uh, black woman who were best friends in the Wild West and about sort of a political story underneath all this. Yeah, and I think what was sort of, what was then to continue that when we were sort of looking for this project to do a couple years ago, we were also thinking, what's a limitation, a good limitation that we can put on ourselves in a world that we can live in that sort of allows us uh, just a color and a view? And we said, let's do. You know, we've been listening to um, Dolly Parton had come out with these three bluegrass albums in the late 90s that were just so good. And we've been listening to Alison Krauss and, you know, a lot of Bella Fleck and these great bluegrass players. And like, what, what if we do a show like that? And, you know, and just a challenge for us to learn that music because I'm not, you know, five, ten years ago, if you said, you're going to write a big bluegrass show, I'd be like, no, I'm not. What are you right. talking about? <laughs> but, you know, it, so, so we sort of doing that. And, and one of the things we sort of set out to do at first, we're like, it's going to be strictly bluegrass. It's going to be just bluegrass chords and various, and then 
that went out the window because that's just not the world we live in. And so it's, it's kind of an amalgam of the two things. And it's interesting to look at this song because it doesn't sound, you know, if I'm going to play it, well, you'll hear what I mean. Okay. So it started off with a, a, little, a little tune that I'd given Tom. That, um, do you remember that? So we sort of wrote this little, I'll play just a little bit of this song. I guess I shouldn't have been there Up them kitchen stairs late at night Tucked in your room, spinning tails by candlelight I guess I shouldn't have been there Where your daddy kept all the booze Sneaking our share like we didn't care And there was only time to lose People always say there's wrong and right there's black and white, no in between. Tell you there's a way to live your life, a proven path, an old routine. Well, that all may be true, but you can't tell a heart what to do. So that's kind of it. That's great. Thank you. But you can imagine that sort of played, right. you know, this is, this is a piano arrangement, but it's supposed to be played with a banjo and two guitars, and it's this great fingering. We had some good players play it, so it's, it's kind of the, the, the world we hear that song in. But if, if money were absolutely no object in the orchestrations, is that still what you would want? Yeah, well, it's kind of fun. I mean, the, what's ended up happening with this is, this is the, I, I'm someone who's a big proponent of, like, I want a no, I mean, money or August, I want a huge orchestra. But this, this show actually, my f the number one orchestra I'd want for it would be, you know, two guitars, bass, fiddle, and maybe three guitar doubles. You know, three guitar doubles, bass, and fiddle. That's it. So a five-person band would be the ultimate. You know. and, and as a composer who is also an orchestrator and arranger, would, will you orchestrate this yourself, or you have somebody else do it? Actually, you know, although I could orchestrate the show, if this were in production, I would want nothing more than to bring in some of these great orchestrators that I watch them work and collaborate with them so I would love to collaborate with some great people, Jonathan Tunick or you know, Bruce Coughlin or you know, Dan, Don Sebesky, these great people yeah. that are, you know, would add something that I wouldn't know how to do. No, that's, you know. that's great. Dave, do you, do you orchestrate your own stuff? Yeah, I do, I do all my own stuff. Um, like for me, I feel like that's the, it's such a huge part of it. I mean, like, yeah. exactly like you were saying, like that, that is a piece for, for a five-piece bluegrass band. You know, like that's what makes the sound. I mean, I feel like that's a big difference between like in writing for musical theater today than it was in like the, the 40s and 50s, but just because like recorded music and especially like rock music made the recording so much a part of what the song is. Like, I mean, a Beatles song, you can't play a Beatles song on the piano. It's gotta be like mm -hmm. with, you know, these weird sounds in it. Like that's what makes it the song. Um, so for me, that just like the sounds of the song is so much a part of the song as opposed, in, in addition to just like the melody and the harmony. So yeah, I do all my own orchestra. And are you a sound designer as well? I'm a sound designer as well, yeah. That's right. so, one of you, I remember reading it, they wanted. I, I, I like to be in charge of every sound. <laughs> in the a show. control freak in our midst. I'm a total midst. control freak when it comes to that, yeah. So, so like the, the show I'm working on right now, um, Beowulf, we kind of like the, the, the heart of that band is we have these dual trombones. And like so much of the show comes from the fact that there are these two trombones. And like without the two trombones, like the music just becomes totally different, you know? And like it's, just, it's not about just Again, it's not just about the melody and the harmony, it's about like the sound of the band. And like for that show, it's like, you know, this big like epic, you know, Norse tale. So like we need these we need these big low horns that kind of Yeah, and scale. I think it's one of the things that's very important for people to understand is that there are scales of show. some scales you can put you can make that were big, you can make tiny, but some and Beowulf, mm -hmm. I imagine if you're expressing Beowulf for the first time in yeah. a new translation anyway, new adaptation needs to have a certain Yeah, and it's definitely one where yeah, I'd I totally have the dream of the seventy five piece orchestra right. for, yeah. that show, and like, for that show. Yeah. But but it's also true, you know, what you're bringing up is a, is, a, is something that I think about a lot too. Like, you know, we all we all work around the piano because that's the the form of we've been told that's kinda how you work and we're sitting here around a piano. But there are so many other ways to express yourself. I mean there's so many other you know, guitarists, or if you're writing a show that has two trombones, in that case, you couldn't minimalize it mm -hmm. past that. Like, if you did a reading, you have to have the two trombones. That's just the way it's going to be. And I think that's, it's good to think about the fact that we need to open our minds a little bit to what, what is the most diluted, or not diluted, but um, what, am I, what, what am I looking for? Nice. Diluted. Yeah, di yeah, kind of form of this. <laughs> the essence. The mm -hmm. essence of what you can present it as. And it may not be piano. You know? Right. 
Right, right. But it, since, it may be a track. It may be yeah. you know something you play on your laptop. Or, yeah, and, and like for Beowulf, when we originally did demo tracks, that's exactly what we did. Like we didn't do it with the piano at all. Like we just had I had like you know worked them all out in, in Logic Pro with all the. Logic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Here we go. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, about the the practical things that you need to do during the day uh, to pay the rent until the moment that, um, you know, that, that your God spell or your whatever, you know, hits. Uh, are, are you, do you still act or is that? No, I, uh, actually my, my wife is pursuing acting, but at the same time, we're both have day jobs. You know, well, when we're done here, I'll go back to my day job. And it's just, and you know, and the logistics of living in New York aside, you know, and then graduate school payments Aside, you know, Maybe I have mean, to lay down now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know, I mean, and the the practicalities of life, you know, can't be put aside for the, you know, for as many cool opportunities as hopefully, you know, will be ahead of us all. And so it's 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 always a, a balancing act. For me, I actually came out of acting as well, but uh, now. Especially as the lyricist side, I feel like I'm surrounded by musicians. <laughs> I you are. Any of this. And uh, uh, for me, it was really finding a way to um, use the the things that I do as a lyricist and a book writer in a professional world and finding where it's useful. So for me, I do uh, some copywriting for advertising. You know, uh, I do some magazine writing. But really, it is a um, it's like a buffet of jobs you have to keep dipping into and pick and choose and see what fits. So that when you have the time, the hardest thing is if you have a a workshop coming. You have to have a job that you can say, hey, I need three weeks to go do this. And that's, that's the, probably the hardest part is yeah. keeping yourself free enough. And yet, you know, I have a life that I have to support and, and don't want to be living in the, the apartment that I lived in when I was 25 in New York, where I was living in a loft uh, with four other roommates and, you know, sleeping in a room the size of this table. You know, right. as, as I've lived in the same apartment since I moved here. <laughs> but you also do some television, do, do you not? Oh, no, well, uh, when I was an actor, I, uh, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of work. My, my acting career basically consisted of every show that ended in the word live, exclamation point. <laughs> I did Schoolhouse Rock live, Blue, Blue's Clues live. So uh, that was kind of my life. And I knew at about 30 that I was sort of hitting the end of where live was going to work for me anymore. I didn't look 16 anymore, so <laughs> it started to, to fade. Mark, you, you had mentioned coming from Nashville, obviously coming from, from a career in, as, as, a, as a studio singer in Nashville. Well, you know, I, I sang as much as I possibly could, but you know, at the same time while I was there, still trying to keep down a job, you know? And, and a full day of studio is it's a good day, but if you don't have one of those every day, you know, that's, that, that's a serious blow. We can see the logic of that kind of stuff and, and writing being connected to the musical theater, but do the, do the people who hire you on the day jobs, do they see the, 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 the connection or are they, do they tend to say, what, what, you do something odd, I want you here? <laughs> Let me speak to that because I'm going to actually go back to these same people. Um, uh, who may be watching. You know what? If they see this, they're going to be so surprised. <laughs> be like, I can't believe this guy. Um, but no, I mean, you know, they. The, the people I work with, I work in real estate, and they do their jobs, and they do their jobs well. And they, I try to do whatever job I can there well, but trying to explain what they do to me, or why they love it to me is tough. As tough as trying to explain what I do, as it is trying to explain what you do to someone who, you know, maybe saw Chicago the movie. Right. right. So they're like, oh, this was, a, someone wrote this? Right. Like, yeah, and then someone took a long time. That's what I do. Right. So it's, uh, it, it's yeah, it's tough to try to find that balance, you know, specifically with a job that is is a real nine to five. You know, we've got some things coming up this summer that I, I don't know how it's going to work in this kind of economy. It's yeah. it's a it's a just a tough place to be, honestly, a musical theater writer, yeah. in general, much less you know someone who has a passion and a job. You, you sort of have to find. Like you said, you sort of decide. There's many different ways of going about it, but I think Tom and I we've talked a lot about this, and it's 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 like we've been. I mean, we're a business partnership, and we've been and and almost best friends because we've been working together for a long time. We met in college, and which was last year. Mm -hmm. no, it was many many years ago, and we've been writing together ever since. So there's growing pains, and, and we've gotten into to arguments, and never anything bad. But it's 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 a struggle because you have to decide that this is what we do. The priority. This is what we write music theater. Like if someone says, "What do you do?" It's like I'm a banker. No, I'm not actually. I, you know, or I'm a you know, copywriter or whatever, or mm -hmm. I'm an orchestrator. It's like no, I'm not an orchestrator. I can orchestrate, but I am a music theater writer. That's what I do. I'm a composer, 
And I think once you sort of make, and we've sort of made up our minds that that is what we do, you know, and then everything else has to serve that function. And you have to keep your mind focused on that because it's going to be a long time before you will make your living doing just that, if ever. You know? And so you, if, you, if you want to do that, you have to make that your priority. And then everything else is, suddenly becomes less of a headache because you're like, well, that's not, I'm not going to stress about that because that's not my, what yeah. I do. Is there anything in the sort of business of the theater and business of the musical theater that, um, that you think is, is key to keeping things on that path? Or do, do you need agents? Do you need managers? Do you need access to people like that? What's, you know, because a lot of people don't understand what the business side of the musical theater is, and there is a business side of it, and what can help? What, what do you need? I, I would say that you need access to counsel. You know, people, who, yep. whether it be people who have gone before you and kind of know what you're up against and where you want to go and, okay, here's my experience. If you have agents, great. And I, I'm lucky just to have recently gotten an agent who is answering questions that I've always had. And this is somebody who saw your work, who you were able to get to see your work at some point? Yes. And then could see the work and say, I like this work, I like you, I want to represent you. Exactly. And a that, key you know, moment, and, I and think. And it's funny. It's because you know now if a contract comes through, I, I had to ask my agent a couple of weeks ago, so tell me how this works again. You look at it, and then I look at it. <laughs> exactly. Or you just look at it, and you just tell me where to sign. I mean, I don't, and they were like, don't worry about it. And I kind of went, OK, I won't. Thank isn't, you very isn't much. That great, it's though? wonderful. That is what's so wonderful about but, and that, But that's why I don't limit it to agents being the only way. But some counsel who can take what your dreams are and take, you know, if it's a contract, if it's a, you know, an opportunity, some theater says, hey, we want to, you know, you know, some sneaky guy with a twirly mustache walks up and says, I want to produce your show. Right. You, know, you have to have somebody <laughs> there who knows, uh, stay away from that. Right, right. You know, right. and that, that is what I would say we all need. I mean, you know, whether it it's in, takes the form of an agent or a mentor or a, you or, know, you know, or a lawyer counsel too. Mm -hmm. I mean, version? yeah. If if you, I mean, if yeah, specifically to use the word counsel. Right. That's why. <laughs> definitively, yeah. Um, yeah. If it's a lawyer, I mean, you will probably need that at some point. You know, it, if your show starts to make bigger, you know, the contracts start to get longer and longer and a little more and more convoluted. Yeah. Have any of you um, written a, a piece based on an underlying work that you had to get rights? Four. Yeah, yeah, I we, think I've heard we, originals we so far, or no, Beowulf, it is true. which there's no Beowulf. Yeah, yeah we're out, you need the rights to the copyright. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, we, we wrote a piece based on a short story by an Argentinian writer, an Argentinian poet, right? Um, and it's a, I love that little piece. It's a short little piece. It's like a 15-minute show. And uh, it was, I mean, we originally did it as part of the BMI workshop. It, was our, it started as our 10-minute piece that we did sort of as a final as that. And it was, for that, we, never, we didn't get the rights. We were just doing it as something. You know. And then all of a sudden, when it wanted to be produced, it was going to be produced at EST here in New York, we suddenly went, oh, we have to get the rights to this. <laughs> and it was, kind of, it was kind of hard to track him down. Um, not to mention the language no, barrier. Language <laughs> we barrier. had to find friends. Do you speak Spanish well enough? My high school Spanish is not going to cover contract law. <laughs> right, right, right. right. And, and when we originally got back you know, through translation or whatever, we originally got back this letter saying, I am so excited you're taking my show to Broadway. <laughs> You know, that was the first we got back. Well, so a couple of steps. Yeah, and, was, and it's a 15 minute musical, which so. doesn't have much of a Broadway life ahead of it, I'm, I'm going to say for say. Right, but we, we did square that away. But it, you know. I know it is funny. We, Tom and I joke that like, with the amount of agents and lawyers that you get connected with, you think that we would be making <laughs> tens and tens of dollars. But, um, but yeah, but I, you know, like, to go on what you said, like, we, we're, we're lucky that we, we also have, we're sort of new with agents uh, within the last year or so. And um, it is a, a totally different. It's really it, it, if the if the agent is someone you really connect with, or your lawyer, it's great because they free you from having to worry about those things about like, oh, is this a good deal or, oh, I don't I don't want you know. It, Am I making a mistake that will affect the rest of my life? Right. right and, now. and or is this important? Right. right. Sure. But, well, we've actually had some agents here recently expose some things. It's like, well, you didn't know not to do this or to do this, and so you're going to have to live with where we are now, and that that's. You know, a, a you know, a dollar, a life dollar, dollar short and a day late. Right. But, you know, it's it's good to have some sort of counsel that can say, you don't know what you're getting into here. But let, also, let me explain what you're getting yeah. into. And also, what's great about them too, it just uh, is that uh, Tom and I. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you totally, but I, I just really avoid conflict. I hate having a conflict <laughs> with someone, like a substantial <laughs> conflict. And when you're working with something that eventually is going to, you know, it's fun. It's all great and fun when we're when doing workshops and all the stuff. But when it comes to 
when there's going to be money involved, everybody wants their fair share, and everybody wants to you know, be protected. And if you're going to work in a room with a producer, you want to be on the best footing as possible, because you have to be creative. Having a lawyer or agent to back you up, they can be the bad cop, right. which is really handy, because you don't want to have that relationship. You want to be able to say, let's write. That's what we do. Anything that that has to take care of, they'll fight that battle. Right. Well, and my collaborator, Tommy and I, are both Southern boys. <laughs> and so right. we, ju we just, we just kind of, you know, we want to be friendly as we possibly can. <laughs> and when it comes down to it, you know, agents have to tell us, we don't have to be friendly. Let us be ugly for you. Right. Right. And we're, we're kind of glad to go, great. <laughs> right. Great. I want to stay nice. Right. I, I feel like I've, I haven't really, like, like, I don't have an agent or, like, the, the whole business world is a, total mystery to me. Um, and I just feel like I've been really lucky in that like all the, the people that have ended up producing my work, it's always been through like relationships that I've formed. Like they've all been friends, you know? So like actually like, the, the people producing Beowulf is this group, Shotgun Players, that I've worked with for like three years. And like my first show with them was I was just music directing Cabaret. And so like that's how I got to know them. And so and I became friends with them. And so like there's this element of trust there where it's not like this, you know, producer with the greasy mustache right. that I don't know if he has my best interest in mind. Like I know that they have my best interest in mind, which is really nice. So like it's, it's just it's nice to have that like community already in place and just be working out of we that need community. To move to San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. No, just, <laughs> I was gonna say though, even more than just the, the business council, I think the other side of it, uh, the business is really picking up this sort of slowly as you go, is just finding these people and you slowly realize that you have this family with you. Yeah. And yeah. that's really how in this day and age the, the career is gonna be created because you're not gonna have that nineteen fifties there's 10 new musicals every every year. You've got to find a community of people that you just want to work with and who trust you and you like. And slowly you look behind you and realize, oh, I've got this family now. Well, and that's you know one thing that's good for us with with Goodspeed because up until we got agents, they really did take care of us. You know, I mean, they really helped us. You know, hey, we want to we want you guys to come up and write, and we love what you're doing. And but you know, and then when it came down time, it was like, okay, now we're getting into you know, some brass tax issues, it'd probably be best if you had an agent. And so they helped us kind of connect with the right people, you know, and have the right people see our work. And, but that honestly strengthened, I think, our relationship because it's like now no one's, uh, no, no one's in the dark as to what's going on. And it, we never mistrust them at all. But it's nice to have someone who can look at this and say, they're being honest with you. They're being completely 100% honest with you and they're giving you what they got. Right. Not. Uh, this doesn't look good, or this is not enough money, or I, you know, I have to lose my job to do this. I mean, th they yeah. they can look at it and go, "This is fair." So I mean, that's that. But that community is really yeah. important. But I also think the idea of the family. I think it's important to understand that you don't know where that family is going to come from. Absolutely not. If I again, I think it's like we've all said. If I had to predict where I was going to be ten years ago, I would never say this. It's just you you build these relationships. You find a director that you just enjoyed working with, and suddenly that's a part of your and your and you can call the person that director up and say, I like you. Can we do something together? Or I had this idea. Or you know, it really is that sort of grassroots. I hate to be like Mickey and Judy putting on a show. <laughs> right. Really, that's how well, it has to be. Jonathan feel. Larson putting on Rent. I mean, yeah. that's part of I think why the whole Jonathan Larson grants are so special because I think I mean certainly, the, to the extent that I've gotten to know the the, the Larson family, I mean that's what they what they they feel so. Um, I mean, in in the grief that they've obviously had, they so cared about what Jonathan's passion was and how can we try to support that passion mm -hmm. um, in, in, in another generation. I think that's... Yeah, I think it's like Curtis was saying, whether or not we make millions of dollars, this is our passion, we want to be doing it. So whatever, whether it's with a group of people in a, you know, a middle school <laughs> you know, metal shop, or it's Broadway, it do, it's, it's about the passion of creating theater and creating music theater. Well, it's, and it's too hard for it not to be yeah. <laughs> a passionate thing for you. I mean, it's, it's not one of those things that, yeah, I kind of like doing that. This is not that. I mean, it's like, I mean, honestly, anyone pursuing acting, for that matter, this is, you, you, have you to, really have to love it to put up with, you know, little, you know, waiting tables and, you know, being but, at but auditions even, at 7 o'clock in the morning, that kind of thing. But, but even in, you know, even if you're lucky enough, sometimes I am to work in the field you want to be in. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, I, I'm, I don't make money writing, writing for music theater. I, I make a little bit of money doing arrangements for other people or associate, doing all the associate positions or being a copyist I was for a long time. But, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what you do. Or if you, you know, as an actor, you know, you, you sometimes jump for joy that you get booked in a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial that's going to make you a lot of money. Oh, yeah. But that's not your passion. It's just, it's, again, it's, it's the day job on your way. It just happens to be in 
what you do, but you really wanted to get that Shakespeare piece that you do in your garage with your friend. That, that might be your passion. Right. Yeah. And it's so good if you can make if you can make those day jobs if you can like think of them in in the the frame of like in this is my career as a musical theater. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about the Big Beast Broadway. Um, I have gray hair. Broadway probably isn't today what it was when I was a kid going to it. Um, it. Does it still have an attraction to you all? And if so, what's that attraction? Just for me, coming from black box theater and coming from small like downtown experimental theater, where it's this really close intimate relationship you have with these people. You know, and I, and I went to like in, in the Heights like a, a few a month ago or so, and um, I was just so far back, and I just couldn't see anyone's face, and I just felt it just felt very strange to me. Like it didn't feel like the kind of theater that I wanted to make, and like I realized that I'm making musical theater, and that Broadway is is the big place. But like, there's something that happens when you get into that large of a house that the show just becomes a totally different kind of beast. Like it becomes this like big popular entertainment Disneyfied thing, you know, and. It doesn't necessarily have to do that, but there is something just about the size of it that, that there is going to be an element of that, that you can't get the really intimate thing, you know, the, the, the look on the face. And, um. But if I had a show and I liked your work and I said, I want you to write a show for the theater that, that In the Heights is in, would that be a challenge to you? Or would you say, no, I'd rather, I'm, that's not me? I wouldn't say no. <laughs> no I wouldn't say no. Um, but like I mean, I mean that, that's, a, that's a conversation we've had like with, with Beowulf. Like we're we're opening Beowulf in April in a in a 350 seat house, and that feels really good. Like that it feels like it is that big. But to go beyond that, just because of where we're coming from and the type of theater that we make as this like small ensemble theater, like experimental theater group, like I can't imagine that show in a 650 seat house like that. You know, like it just it's just going to lose so much of what I think makes the show really special. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's an absolutely valid point and a very important point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but I don't know, you know, what is the alternative? I mean, because at the same time, I'd like to be, you know, make it famous and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, can you get famous doing off-Broadway? Like, well, the Fantastics you, never yeah. played on Broadway and, and that's, uh, that's, that's, you know. Yeah. I think there's well, certainly, you know, today you have to look at your options and say what's best for the piece. Mm -hmm. And looking at Broadway, it's, it's an economic model more than anything else. And it's a dream because it's a part of what we learn as kids. You think of a Broadway show. But the more you work in it, you realize there's amazing regional theaters that, gosh, I would be, I'd be thrilled to have a show live a life in those regional theaters. I mean, that would be incredible. And it's about being realistic and knowing that that dream of Broadway is just that. It's a dream that might happen, but we're going to write the best show and see where it fits and try to, to work within that. And w with the, the, the show that, that you described er earlier, is that one that you might want to do at a regional theater first? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Stagecoach Mary would Stagecoach. fit perfectly in that sort of arena, Goodman. <laughs> we should be so lucky. Uh, th those kinds of theaters would be perfect for that show. I watched my dreams I'll walk away Certain she come back someday She never did We presented this last fall at the NAMP, the National Alliance of Music Theater, so and now we're in the process of sort of figuring out where best that our show might fit or where we might go next. Um, you know, Explain what that is a little bit, because NAMP. The National Alliance for Music Theater is an organization of all of the regional theaters. Um, that produce musicals. That produce musicals. And so uh, once a year, or actually it's more than once a year, but I think this, this festival happens once a year. They invite them all, all the heads of, and representatives for all these theaters across, um, uh, actually across the world. It's not just America. There's people that came from everywhere. They come to New York, and then uh, they, they are presented with usually eight musicals, uh, eight clippings of musicals. They can look at um, as possible um, musicals that they might want to develop or produce or do joint productions with, and et cetera, et cetera. Chosen by the organization? Chosen mm -hmm. by the organization, And yeah. presented by anybody or presented by the theaters that are, that are members? Normally, you have to be sponsored by a theater or a member organization. Um, but there's also other ways. Like we were not, we were not represented by a theater. We were submitted by our agent and uh, selected, and so we went in without 
the sort of a NAMP member support, but then they give you someone as a as a, um, a guide through the process. But it's an amazing way to sort of be seen by all these people from a business standpoint. That's truly kind of like a, a Sundance if right. the best and, sort of situation. And it's specifically about a show. It's not, I mean, the, the, the writers are the writers of the show. The show is what's being featured. Yeah. Though, for yeah. us, one of the things we really loved about the process was it, it was sort of like a, a you know, uh, a coming out party for us as writers to say, look, we're a serious team, and even if this show isn't perfect for this theater, um, we're here and ready to write new things, and if you have projects, here's the rest of our stuff, here's our website, go listen to our stuff. And that has been actually, in some ways, more valuable than just the exposure for the show, is people saying, oh, these aren't just two kids in their, in their garage making music, they're serious and let's maybe work with them. So, so that in conjunction with the Larson, I mean, it's, it's all sort of a building block process, yes? Absolutely. And there are a lot of organizations like that. I mean, for us, one of the most supportive organizations as well was the, the O'Neill mm -hmm. um, Foundation that, you know, they brought us up there as young artists when we were just starting out, to just observe the festival up there. And then we had another one of our shows, Triangle, done there as one of the, sh the shows for the summer. And that's really about writers and supporting a piece and getting it workshopped. And it's finding those organizations, again, those, that family of people who cares about right. you. It's truly the hardest work we've ever done and the most fun we've ever had working is you have two weeks where it's about the writers. The actors yeah. are there to do whatever you say. You can walk in and say, here, here's a song. We just wrote it this afternoon. Let's, let's put it in the show tonight in front of an audience. Pressure cooker. That's not yeah. bad for the musical. No, theater. it's very good. Uh -huh. Deadlines are our friend. Yeah. We need more of them. <laughs> because, like somebody, one of you said earlier, that you, I think you, you can sit if you don't have these kind of this kind of feedback, you know, a, a grant or a presentation. You will sit and write a show forever. Sometimes somebody needs to just say, "Okay, you're done. We have to present it now. You have right. to stop." Right. You know. Well, I mean, in the the, the, I, the name escapes me right now, but there is a famous musical theater writer throughout history who said, you know, great shows are never completed, they're simply abandoned. And that's, you know, that's you know, kind of at some point, and honestly, I love that point where I, I can, you know, send it to an orchestrator or an arranger or a director or actors and go, please, you're the next part of this piece. You're the next part of the collaboration that is so important. I want to see where it goes when you get your hands on it, you know, and that it may be different. If, I, if it's wrong, if it's not what I meant, that's one thing. I might right. tell you that, but if it's, here's a fresh perspective on this work. I love that. Right. I want to see that. Somewhere between the I don't like conflict and the <laughs> collaborative back and forth that is part of the collaborative world. Right. I think. Broadway, do you want to, do you want to write on Broadway? <laughs> Fiscally, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fiscally, yes. yes uh, absolutely. I mean, who, who doesn't, you know, want you can, to They say you, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing. Exactly. Yep. I mean, who wouldn't want the success of, you know, a show like Wicked or Hairspray or Avenue Q for that matter? You know, to have that kind of residuals, you know, those kinds of residuals. But, you know, at the same time, I also find some of the most extraordinary, uh, extraordinary theater I've ever seen has been in small, tight houses where you can actually see the actors acting. You can see, or, or even better than acting, you can see them actually becoming a character and you're just lost in them, not in the spectacle. So, yes and no. I mean, I would love to have my name in lights, <laughs> but I would also love to you know, have something that people walk away from. You know, shows like Floyd Collins for me mm. really put, you know, put a, a good, I don't know, parentheses around where I would like to find myself, that kind of niche where it's like, it's close, you can get close to it, and it's still as beautiful as if you back far away from it. And, you know, those shows, Violet is another one, you know, Janine DeSori, uh, beautiful. But, I mean, maybe if you got way back far from it in a huge Broadway house, you'd lose some of it. Um, but it, as you see, I mean, both she and Adam Gettle and, uh, can write big and small. So it's, I would like to be one of those guys. Well, it's very, very easy to say Broadway is, you know, is hard and, and um, you know, unwelcoming. But I, I think if you look at the Avenue Qs and the, in the Heights and shows that, 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 that there, are, there are opportunities for young writers. And I, and I, I think that uh, you, know, I, I think it, you, may, you may actually be in not a bad time. Well, and I, think, I think that Avenue Q is a great example because they were in our BMI class. And I don't think they set out to write a Broadway show. They wrote a good show. Right. And it finds its place. It will find where it needs to live. And that's the thing. Write the show. Don't target, gosh, I want to write the next Hairspray, so I'm going to sit down and try to do that. I You'll just never be able to do I it. I just don't think it'll work. You have to write what write. you want to write. So, so as, as writers, be true to yourself. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but watching that process 
they just had an idea and they, they worked at it and it sort of bloomed and blossomed. If there was one thing other than money that somebody could say, uh, here, here's what I'll offer, I can offer you, to, you know, what help I can give you, what's, what's sort of one thing that, that, that could be, what kind of help could we be given that would get you to some place, the next place? I would love to have the same thing we do at the O'Neill Center to happen every six months. You know, I would love someone to say, come in and for two weeks we have all these fantastic actors who will do your bidding. Give you and resources. Resources, I think. Resources. Especially space. Like space, just someone who yeah. can just give you the space. Like that would be my dream. Someone just gives me a space for two months and says, do what you want. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> you know, that would be that would be it. Well and adding and just adding to both of those things are all desperately needed. Then I'll give you the space, I'll give you the resources, and I'll pay you a little. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's uh, not to put too fine a point on it. I mean, that's those are that's the reality of of this world, and much less living in New York with you know student loan debts and things like that. You know, I mean, that's it's it's easier for me to go, and it's harder for me to leave because what I'm leaving is a is is a job. You know, I mean, it's it, the being out of town is not as big a deal as not being here and making money. You know, so th those are the kind of, that's a logistical need and that's I hate saying that because it sounds like not passionate if you're really passionate you live in a box on this, right. you know in a, in a van down by the river but no. it's just not reality and you know I wish I had better resources but I don't so you, you do what you got to do to make what you want to do a reality well I want to thank you all for being here this has been a remarkable uh, time and I want to congratulate you for being recipients of the 2009 Jonathan Larson grants and uh, good luck in all your future endeavors. I look forward to seeing shows of yours on Broadway, off Broadway, and across the country and across, around the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Ted Chapin, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing. The American Theatre Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theatre. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, our work reaches beyond Broadway and beyond New York. Our Working in the Theatre programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our theater company grants support New York not-for-profits and total nearly $3 million since they began, while the Jonathan Larson grants support emerging composers and lyricists. Our theater intern group helps young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, AmericanTheaterWing.org.